You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everyone? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kerlop, a.k.a. The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host, Ziana McIntyre, a.k.a. Z Money. How are you doing today, Z? Oh, I am doing so great because I am just really loving this episode. This is all feely, touchy, deep, like I like. This yeah, this is a me episode. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a Z episode, but I will be lying if I said I didn't love it as well. Uh, Doc, you can just hear it in his voice, in his storytelling, and who he is. is such an authentic, genuine human being, and he has experienced so much wisdom, more than anyone that I know probably because he has been able to take care of the people who are dying and hear their last words, their last thoughts. And, you know, some of the things that they'd wish they had done in their life, which obviously doc is applying to his life and he's going to help you apply to your life through the writing of his new book, taking stock. Yes. So we talk a little bit about his book, but definitely go check it out. He let us preview the book and I'm already really gaining a lot. It's really allowed me to sit back and like think about my life, do some journaling around it. And there's just like some great workbook activities in it. So definitely check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Definitely check the book out. Uh, Doc is again, he's got quite the story, right? Is, you know, we will let him tell it, but just the, you know, quick premise is that like, you know, a a loved one of his uh, had passed when he was young and that kind of shaped his whole life. And he talks through his identity shift and all these different things that, you know, happens when you hit financial independence and all these struggles and all that. And so uh, such a good episode. Sorry, I feel like I want to reveal the whole thing, but I should let Doc, let Doc tell a story. Don't, don't steal the spotlight from him. So let's bring him on. Hey guys, if you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent like us, um, you might want to go to Kaplan. That's where I got my license and I found that they made all this really dull information actually kind of interesting um, and very memorable. So if you're looking at getting your license, see if they have your state. They cover a lot of states, but not all of them. And if you want to get a little discount, use our code INVEST2. So the word invest in the number two. Thanks, guys. Doc G, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? I am so happy to be here and to be talking to you guys today. Yeah, I am stoked to have you here. We were just on your podcast a couple of weeks, last week, a couple weeks ago. I don't even know. Time flies. It, it was just a few weeks ago, and we were talking about the Phi team, which I just think is an amazing concept. So sometimes I wish I lived in Denver so I could just take advantage of, of what's there. Denver is accepting new people if, you're, uh, if you ever want to make it out this way. But, Doc, it's so good to meet you, to, to talk to you. You know, we met, I think, back at FinCon in D.C. at, like, this weird, I don't know if you remember, but we were in this, like, weird underground bar type thing. Or I don't know, that, that's the vision in my head. Um, and, yeah, had some good conversations and love to hear what you're all about and what you're up to. So let's get this thing started with, uh, Doc, tell us where you first heard about financial independence. So I first heard about financial independence, I think it was about 2014. And, you know, I was lucky. I grew up in a pretty financially savvy household. So my parents were business owners. They actually owned real estate. At one time, I think my parents owned about 10, 15 doors. Um, And they were side hustlers. And they always saved more than they spent. So I grew up knowing the idea of what being financially savvy was. But I didn't really have the words or the vocabulary Fast forward to the 2000s, I had become a physician. I was practicing internal medicine. I was starting to burn out and I was looking for a way out. And I was kind of thinking, you know, I don't know if I can work the next 20 or 30 years in this profession. How much money do I need in order not to have to work again? And so I went to my 
financial advisor at the time, and he did a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations. You guys have all heard this. He put the numbers in. And for one, he wasn't willing to include my real estate because I had owned a few properties at that point. He wasn't willing to put include my real estate as part of my investment portfolio. So he just put all the money I had in real estate completely aside. He did some calculations and he said, you know, it's going to be a good 10, 15 more years of working. And so I went to my accountant and my accountant said, I think you need $10 million to retire. Didn't have a reason why, just kind of came up with this $10 million number. So I was resigned to this idea in 2014 that I was going to be working for at least the next decade. And I was writing a medical blog at the time. And I had a little bit of a following and I got a phone call in my office. And my secretary is like, there's this guy on the phone. He wants to talk to you about your blog. So I get on the phone and his name is Jim Dolly. And he has a platform called The White Coat Investor. And he just wrote a book called The White Coat Investor about investing for high net worth individuals. So he wanted me to review his book for my blog. And I said, you're going to give me a free book? Sure, send it over. So he sent the book to me and I read it and it took literally three or four hours. And by the time I had finished, I, I sat down, you know, from one cover to the other, read it all the way through. And by the time I had finished, I kind of understood what personal finance was. I understood what financial independence was. And I realized that I actually had enough money to either severely cut down at work or stop work completely. Wow. So you were basically financially independence, independent before you even knew about financial independence. My question for you, though, is rewind it back a little bit. What, why did you become a doctor? Was it because your parents told you? Was it because you, made a lot of, you knew you'd make a lot of money? Or like, what was the, you know, what was the motivation there? Because I know there's a lot of school, a lot of debt that's kind of associated with that. And, and do you recommend going the doctor route for people that may want to achieve early financial independence? So I have wanted to be a doctor since ever since I can remember as a little kid. When I look back, I think it's because of my father. My father died when I was seven years old and he died suddenly and he was an oncologist it means he was a cancer doctor. And at that age, I wanted to be just like him. Like I wanted to walk like him. I wanted to talk like him. I idolized him. And so him dying when I was that age, it just kind of stuck in my mind that I wanted to do exactly what he did, which was no small thing. Actually, at seven years old, I was diagnosed also with a learning disability. I was having a lot of trouble learning how to read. I was way behind my peers. So there's, there's, there's this question at that time whether I would just kind of be normal, right? I'd be able to read and write and do the things that normal kids do. But it stuck in my head. And I was like, I need to fill his shoes. He was 40 when he died. And I was like, I need to do all those things he never got to do. I need to take his place. And so that stuck with me. And it carried me through getting over the learning disability, studying like a madman in high school. I remember in college, I went to University of Michigan. And everyone would go to the football games on Saturday morning. You know, University of Michigan has this huge stadium with 100,000 seats, et cetera. And I would be at the law library with my book Saturday morning you know, studying for my biochemistry classes. So that drove me. And I didn't think about it. I never thought why. Like, is this really what I want? Is this really who I am? But I knew I had a passion for helping people. And I knew I wanted to do what he did. Fast forward, you know, 20 years later, I can't say I regret doing it. I mean, there are a lot of amazing, valuable things that came from being a doctor, being able to help people on a regular basis being able to become part of people's lives and learn their stories has been so powerful in mind. So I don't, you know, I think I would do it again. But if you're just looking to get financially independent, there are a lot of easier ways. Now, when I say <laughs> yeah. easier, I don't mean economically easier, because actually as a doctor, you can make lots of money and there's all sorts of side hustling and all sorts of things you can do. But emotionally, there are a lot of easier ways. You guys talk about real estate all the time. Like my 48 year old self, could look back and say, you know what, at 22, 23, I had a little bit of money. I had a little bit of savvy. You know, if I wanted to take a different route, I could have gone into real estate and probably got to financial independence much faster and with a lot less emotional heartache. So it's a good way if you have passion for doing medicine. But if you don't have passion for doing medicine, I wouldn't suggest going that route. Yeah, that's this is almost I almost, you know, you tell me your story there, Jock, and uh, it almost sounds like a Michael Jordan type story, right? Where, you know, he he obviously was cut from his 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 basketball team. He becomes the best basketball player in the world and then quits basketball, goes to play baseball because his dad, who just recently passed, wanted him to play baseball. And so there's there's something bigger and more powerful than the money, 
but the doctor that you just really liked helping people. And that's what I tell people all the time too. It's like, if you're going to become a doctor or a lawyer for the money, you're going to burn out. You may not even get it through medical school. You may not even get it through law school, but to do it for your reason, I think is huge. Um, and so why don't we kind of like, let's, let's get into, okay, let's jump back to where you just finished reading the white coat investor. And it sounds like that book just like rocked your world. And so, you know, what happens, what happens there? So I was excited and jubilant for about an hour. And then it really hit me that the thing I had built my life around this identity of being a physician, this idea of following in my father's footsteps and the connection it gave to me to this guy that I lost right when I was seven years old, all of a sudden I had to do the really hard work of looking at myself and trying to decide who I am and maybe sever the little bit of wisp of that connection I still had with my father. So I went through a period of real depression and anxiety, probably for a good six months where I had to figure out who do I want to be? What's important to me? I can walk away from medicine right now. Do I want to completely walk away? Are there parts I still like? Are there parts I don't like? And it really set me off on a voyage of trying to figure out who I am and what's important to me. In fact, I started writing a financial blog at that time called Diversify. And I went through a period of writing every single day about whatever was on my mind and publishing it. And the whole idea behind that was it was like this online diary of my attempts to figure out what money means, why is it important, now that I'm financially independent, what am I going to do with myself? What does meaning and purpose look like once you have enough money? It was a hard six months to a year of just deep thoughtfulness. I didn't change anything with work. Like I didn't quit work. I didn't walk away. I actually gave myself the time and the space to try to figure out who I am and what I want, figuring then I would address the work issue and decide what was worth keeping and not keeping. I really relate to this because um, when I decided to be financially independent, I, I stepped away from work at the time that I reached my number. And I was going through a really hard time. It was right when my mom passed away. Um, but I kind of had this sort of, man, I've been working towards this thing and now I realized I'm there. And it's almost a depression. It's like now I'm responsible for making myself happy. And I can't just say, oh, I'm not happy because I don't have this yet or because this job is making me do this. It's like, it's a lot of responsibility. And I think people don't talk about that in the financial independence movement. So I really appreciate that um, as I was reading through your book and doing some of the exercises. Yeah, I think people really don't realize we set up money or net worth or even financial independence as a goal and sometimes forget to see that it's not really a goal, it's more of a tool. The real goal is to figure out who we are what do we want to do in this world? What is our legacy going to be? Something I like to call our purpose, identity, and connections, what those are. And it's really low-hanging fruit to go after money. I know that people think that making money and getting to financial independence is difficult, and that is true. There is difficulty there. But it's also low-hanging fruit. What really is difficult is actually figuring out what we want to do with that money that fulfills us and that gives us a sense of purpose. And, um, you know, that's a hard thing to do. Now, as I've transitioned out of the kind of medical practice I had, I do a lot more hospice and palliative care, which means I take care of the dying. And they've made me very thoughtful about this idea of what are those things that I want to accomplish before I leave this earth? Because often they get a diagnosis and have weeks or months left. And then they have to decide what are their goals and what do they want to accomplish? And it's really interesting to take that lens and look at our money struggles with that lens. Um, and I've been doing a lot of that lately. Yeah, I love this concept of the dying teaching you how to live. Um, one of my favorite books is Tuesdays with Maury. I don't know if you've read that book, but it's a whole story of kind of like the mentor who's passing away and the student who's learning all these life lessons through him. Um, and so I think that's just, yeah, a really beautiful reminder that when we have mortality kind of at the edge, we realize, wow, okay, you don't live forever. You can't just be as uh, frivolous with your days. Doc, what, what are some of the lessons that you may have learned from these people who are, you know, in their last days, weeks, months to live? I think there are a few main ones. 
first and foremost, almost no one says on their deathbed or somewhere close, I wish I made more money. No one does that. No one says, I wish I spent more nights and weekends at work and less time with my family. It, it just doesn't happen, right? So I think our monetary goals are less important than we think. I think we need enough money to accomplish our other goals. So then that becomes another question. What do people regret when it comes to their other goals? A lot of times they regret that they didn't have the courage to actually face up what they really wanted in life and go after it. Whether that be a place to travel to or a goal to fulfill or people to connect with that they've lost a connection with. It's what did we not have the courage to do that's important to us, and why didn't we try? Interestingly enough, what people don't regret is failure, and this is a common misconception. We don't regret what we tried at and failed. We regret what we didn't have the courage to try, and I think that's something that I really, really took away from the dying. Wow, that's super powerful. Super, super powerful. Like, you know, just let that sink in, and I think that talking to people of that age of that amount of wisdom like you're talking you probably have maybe tens of thousands of years of wisdom underneath your belt from maybe a hundred plus hundred year olds right or something like that right however that however that math works and so to to listen and and to be able to take away those lessons and all of them being just hey what matters the most and what i'm gathering is if i had to boil it down to two words it's experiences and relationships Right. Those are the two things that matter if there's nothing else that matters. So you can have all the money in the world, but make sure that you are every single month or year or whatever time frame that you look at your life by, make sure you're given a big emphatic check on your experiences and on your relationships. And if those aren't there, then I think you're going to, you know, your life, you're going to regret a big piece of it. Is there anything else, Doc, that you may have learned from from those people? You know, I think there's also a place for personal goals. So I, I think you're very much right. Experiences and people are big, but I think personal goals are important. But again, it gets more to the giving yourself the courage and giving yourself the okay to go after it, even if it's scary or difficult. So for me, for instance, you know, a big goal was to write a book that was published by a traditional publisher. I had self published books about medicine before. And I had been putting that goal off forever. I mean, I really had. And deep down inside, I think I realized that there was a lot of fear. There's fear of failure. There's fear of not doing it as well as I could. But dealing with the dying also made me realize that time is finite. And so I either make the decision now and jump in, or I put it off to a point where maybe I won't get a chance. So I don't think we should discount personal goals. I think they can be important too. Um, I just think we have to be thoughtful about them and why we want them. Again, no one really says my goal is my real deep down personal goal is to be the net worth of two million dollars. Right. So that might be our financial goal. But what we're really trying to say is we want to have that two million dollars so we can do those things that are important to us. So the question is, what are those goals that are important to us? And some of them might be personal goals. I want to be a black belt in karate. You know, that's fine. That might be really important to you. The point is that we have to then have the courage to go after those things. All right, Doc. So uh, my question, you know, I'm a little bit confused here on the timeline. So on 20, you know, when you read The White Coat Investor in, in your kind of world is, you know, you, you're seeing the light of this financial independence thing. Are you still in hospice at this time? Are you working with the dying? Kind of when are you wor working through the dying at this point? So let me give you the timeline. I finished, well, I started medical school in 1995. The first week of medical school, I walked into the hospital and signed up to be a volunteer in the hospice program. And this was actually, this was my body telling me something. The first patient I ever saw as like a first week or two in medical school was actually volunteering as a hospice volunteer. So clearly this was something that was important to me, probably because my, I experienced my father dying and somewhere deep down inside, I wanted to help other people make that transition. Cause you know, I was seven years old. I didn't know what to do with that. And so as I started my career, I was interested in this, but as many people do, I kind of put that aside and was a hospice volunteer for a few years and then got my career going and went into general internal medicine, where I was just pretty much taking care of adults of all stripes and kinds, doing pretty much everything except surgery. I was seeing patients in an office. I was seeing them in the nursing home. I was occasionally even seeing them in their home. So I was doing very general medicine. About 10 years into my career, in my own private practice, I remember one day 
I was seeing a patient in the hospital and they were dying and I had consulted hospice, right? So the hospice nurse comes to evaluate the patient. But in the meantime, I was doing a lot of quote unquote hospice things. I was putting the patient on a morphine drip because they were in pain. I was getting their comfort medications ready. I was talking to the family about the prognosis and how soon the, their loved one would be dying. I was kind of doing all these things. And this hospice nurse looked at me and she said, you need to work with us. This is clearly something you're good at. And at that time, hospices were looking for doctors. So I had a full practice and I was starting to get burned out in medicine. So we're really talking about somewhere in the 2010, 2014 range. And I was thinking about how am I going to accrue enough money to have enough to eventually pull away from medicine. I was even thinking about side hustles. And then this woman comes up to me and says, you should do hospice with us and you could be a medical director part-time for us. They'll pay you this many thousand dollars a month and you'll have to go to a few meetings and do a few things here and there. So I actually picked up hospice as a side hustle to my general medical practice back <sighs> around 2011, 2012. It was a way for me to make extra money and it was something I happened to be good at. When I realized I was financially independent, instead of just leaving my job, I used something called the art of subtraction. After being really thoughtful about life and realizing I had enough money, I said, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are still some things about medicine I like, but let's systematically get rid of everything that isn't bringing me joy or causing friction, right? So what was causing friction in my work life that I just could do without? And I'm like, my medical practice is stressing me out. I'm going to get rid of that. I'll just see patients in the nursing home and I'll keep doing this hospice side hustle, right? And then after a while, I'm like, wow, the nursing home stressing me out. I'm getting calls at three in the morning, four in the morning. This isn't worth it. I have enough money. Why am I doing this? Let's get rid of the nursing home. So then I went to the hospice and I said, I have some extra time. Why don't I take on a few more teams? So I was doing hospice work. And then at some point I said, I love doing this hospice work, but I don't want to be an employee anymore. I want to be a contractor and I don't want to work any weekends and I don't want to take any night calls. I just want to do the things I want to do. And so I started ruthlessly subtracting from my life the things I didn't like. So from 2014 to 2022 right now, I've basically kept on getting rid of everything. And the only thing that stuck, the thing that I'm like, I will do this even if you don't pay me is to do the hospice work. But now I do hospice work in a very different way. I actually run teams that take care of patients. So I actually don't even see patients anymore. I run teams of nurses, social workers, and chaplains. And we meet, and on a regular basis, they come to me and ask me, is this patient appropriate for hospice? Yes or no. Okay, this patient is having pain. How can we manage this pain? Okay, I tell them what orders to give. And then for the very high-level discussions where there are real problems with families or patients, I will come in and have a family meeting and talk to the patients and families about what should be done next. So it was a process of subtracting out all those things I didn't want to do in my career. And I'm left with the thing that really feels much more aligned with my purpose. I found the part of medicine that really resonates with me that I would do even if I didn't make any money at it. And it's kind of funny looking back. It was also the first thing I did as a medical student. It just took me a bunch of years to kind of get back to who I really was. Hey everyone, big news. Investify has now partnered with Rent Ready. And yes, we've partnered with Rent Ready because that is the software system that both me and Ziana use to do property management for our rental properties. It makes things super easy. We can send applications, get background checks and credit checks. They, uh, tenants, when they come in, can pay rent automatically through there. They can submit maintenance requests, do everything you need to do for property management all in one place. That's why Rent Ready is the thing that we've done. I've been using them for years now. And that's why they're, you know, we, we reached out to them for a relationship on the show. And so, again, super excited to have them on board. If you go to rentready.com and use the code INVESTIFY, you'll get 50% off your first six months. That's right, 50% off your first six months if you go to uh, rentready.com, sign up and use the coupon code invest2fi. Uh, and can't wait to see you there. Let us know, you know, hit us up on Instagram, hit us up on wherever, and let us know what you think of, of Rent Ready. Because uh, again, I think it's an amazing software. I use it all the time. You can access it from your phone. Amazing stuff. So thanks so much. And let's get back to the episode. Wow. So, I mean, picking up hospice as a side hustle is so interesting because I guess I don't know the difference between regular medical care and hospice in the workload and the emotional load, but I would assume that being around the, the death and dying is pretty intense. So 
I'm surprised to hear you say that that was less of a burnout scenario than your traditional work. Can you kind of go into that a little bit? Well, so it's funny because we traditionally think about burnout as emotional strain and trauma from work. I was incredibly comfortable talking to family members and patients about death. That wasn't burning me out at all. You know what was really burning me out? The reams of paperwork that I had at my desk for all of my outpatients. It was the phone calls in the middle of the night. It was the medical legal threat of being sued every time you took care of an extensively ill patient in the hospital. The things that were really causing me burnout had nothing to do with hospice care. Hospice care in some ways was very rejuvenating for me because it was really part of who I had become. Dealing with death as a, as a small kid and then dealing with it all the time in my general medicine practice where I was taking care of the elderly on a regular basis. I mean, I was dealing with death all the time. That didn't burn me out. In fact, like I said, that could be very uplifting, especially when you did it with a hospice where you were bringing families together, you were taking care of pain and helping people die in such a way that they were surrounded by people they loved and that they were comfortable. That energized me. What was burning me out was just the other parts of medicine that, that just didn't feel authentic or good anymore. I felt like I was rushing through patient care as opposed to sitting there and spending the time people needed to really solve their problems. Yeah, um, I really love just to go into your book a little bit, I, I love that you chose to make it like a workbook where you're taking some of these lessons and some of the activities that you do with people in hospice where they're taking stock over their life um, uh, and kind of bringing that to people that don't have this finite timeline. So what made you kind of choose that direction as a format for the book? So. The book is highly theoretical, right? There's a lot of philosophy in there. And one thing I wanted to make sure is that people didn't just read it and say, okay, I get the philosophy, but then didn't know how to use the lessons from the book in their own life. So at the end of each chapter is pretty much a workbook format. As you said, it is a, it's a list of questions you can ask yourself and then work through a process to help you think about how you view life, how you view death, how you view your finances, how you want your career to look like. So I wanted them all to be very practical lessons at the end of each philosophical chapter so that people could feel like they could use this in their everyday life as opposed to this was just a thought experiment, but they didn't know what to do with it. Um, I want to talk about one concept that I learned in the book that I'm only uh, at the maybe halfway point or a little bit less than that, um, but I've been really enjoying it. And I did a lot of sitting and journaling and stuff with it. So I think it's perfectly coming to me at this time that I needed to reflect on these things. But one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the concept of cruise fi, which I had not heard of before. I think that was the right term, but it was Coast, just the idea. Yeah. Oh, Coast Fi. Coast Fi, yeah, yeah. Of where you sort of figure out, maybe you can explain it better than I could because it was a little bit confusing, but I liked how the person was sort of working backwards and realizing, well, I don't have to do it all right now. If I keep up with a certain pace, I can still achieve my financial goal, but it doesn't have to feel like it's taking up my whole life space. So I first heard of Coast Fi from a guy named Zach who wrote, writes a blog called Three Pillar Freedom. And Coast Fi is reverse engineering, right? So it's starting at the end, deciding what you need, and then building a very reasonable life today that will get you to that end. So in the financial independence community, we have ways of figuring out how much money we feel we need to be financially independent and not work anymore. Some people use a safe withdrawal rate of 4%. Some people use the 25 times rule. We're not gonna get deep into that, right? Cause that would take a lot of time to explain, but the 25 times rule is the idea that if I live off of $40,000 a year, multiply that by 25, that's a million dollars. If you have a net worth of a million dollars and it's invested, that should really make enough money for you to live at least the next 30 more years without making any more money than what your money makes off investment. So the idea behind Coast Fi is let's reverse engineer this. Let's say I know that I'm going to want a million dollars in savings, in investments at the age of 55 so that I can not work anymore 
And that million dollars will give enough money off of appreciation and dividends to live for the next 30 years. But I'm 20 now, right? And I'm looking at the next 35 years of working and I just don't know if I can put my head to the grindstone and work from 20 to 55 to accrue that million dollars. So what Coastify does is it takes advantage of compounding. We know that little bits of money put in the stock market, making a certain amount of return every year over decades compounds quickly and you end up with a lot more money than you thought you had started with. So basically compound interest is the interest you make off your interest, right? <laughs> so you can calculate at the age of 20, how much money do I need saved up such that I'll have a million dollars at 55. So let's just say, and I'm not doing, I'm not looking at the calculations now, but let's say that you know 20 to 55 is 35 years. You can use a compound interest calculator and calculate making 7% in the stock market on your returns. How much money do you need now that put into the stock market making 7% annually for the next 35 years will end up being a million dollars by the age of 55. And then you can work towards making that money now as fast as you can, get it into the stock market, and then you can let that money slowly build itself up to the million dollars without you touching it. In other words, you are coasting to financial independence at 55, but you put the money away in the stock market and you let it sit there and it's going to do all the hard work. You are not financially independent yet because you still need to make enough money every year. Once you hit that number in the bank, let's say it's $100,000 or $200,000 that over 35 years will eventually be a million. Once you get that money in the stock market, you're not done. You're not financially independent because you still have to work every year to make enough money to pay for your yearly needs, right? If you live off of $40,000 a year, you might still need to do a part-time or full-time job or at least an easier job that makes enough money, the $40,000 a year, so you can pay for rent and you can pay for food, and you can pay for travel, all those kind of things. But you can stop saving pretty much because you know that money is in the bank compounding that's going to eventually make it to a million dollars by the age of 55. I know it's a kind of complex explanation, but the idea is get enough money early saved away, let the power of compounding get it to you towards financial independence, and then just support yourself with whatever you need for your yearly needs up to that point. Yeah, I, th I think maybe some people would maybe the hardest thing to do here is one, make a ton of money, make a ton of money and then stop seeing that money come in. And so like, it seems like maybe you've gone through that with your, you know, just kind of with your transition, the artist attraction, like how, you know, how did you experience and go through the, Hey, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Maybe you're saving a hundred thousand dollars a year plus to now sure you got all your time back, but like you look at your bank account and it doesn't look as nice. There are a few things about that. So certainly part of letting go of my identity as a physician when I reached financial independence was also letting go of my identity as a high earner. So there's a certain credibility we get in the world as well as we feel internally when we know, hey, I make upper six figures, right? I make a lot of money every year and then I can take that money and invest it and it builds and it builds and it builds. It really feels good, but there gets to a point which I in, in my book call overdrive. So we love this idea of making money and making money feels good. And so we set these goals of how much money we need. And once we get there, we kind of feel empty because we met this goal and we don't know what to do next. The easy thing to do is to just set higher money goals. And so that's what a lot of us do. We get into this overdrive situation where we stop thinking about what that money represents, which is time or ability to work on the things we care about. And we start seeing it as an endpoint in itself. I'm not going to say it's easy, right? Being a high achiever, making a lot of money, and to then all of a sudden step away from it and say, okay, I'm not going to make a lot of money anymore. It isn't easy. But then you also come to the realization that that money isn't really making me more happy. Why am I not fulfilled when I reach that goal? Why does that fulfillment only last for a short period of time? And then I feel like I need another dopamine hit, which means another higher goal. And I need to make even more and more money. The reason why I'm not fulfilled is because that goal doesn't actually fulfill my sense of purpose, identity, or connections. It's not really feeding my sense of needing. It's just an easy, low hanging fruit goal that I can put out there to avoid thinking about the much more difficult things, like who am I and what am I about? I think we need to stop doing that at some point. Like money can't be your end point. It just has to be a useful tool. 
And I think, and I think that's the, the almost the premise of the book, right? Because you've been talking to all of these people who have been dying, and it just, and you know, you said it before, right? The one thing they don't care about is having more money or working harder. And so again, like do the hard thing and that, you know, it may be uncomfortable for a lot of people to get up on stage and deliver a speech to a thousand people, but it's even more uncomfortable for that person to quit, right? To not have any money coming in, to live off their investments, to, right? To, to figure out something else to do with their time. Maybe you're like, you know, something I've always wanted to do is like coach a kid's basketball team, like a high school basketball team or something like that, right? Like. That will pay nothing. I may not even accept a salary when I do that someday, but it's just, it's fulfilling and it's exciting and, and that's it. So like, what is the other thing that is totally not on your identity that you can maybe switch to? I think that might be something for a lot of people to think about as they kind of hit this financial independence marker. Yeah, I mean, look at my dad. He died at 40. Let's say my dad really wanted to coach a, a soccer team or a baseball team and he kept on putting it off. He kept on saying, you know what? I'm not far enough in my career. You know what? The kids are too young or you know what? There are a million excuses because we always think we have enough time. We want to believe that life isn't, we, we want to believe that life isn't finite. We want to believe that we live forever. But the truth of the matter is, it is finite and you have to come to terms with that. You have to come to terms with the fact that eventually you're going to die to realize that there's a set amount of time on this earth to do the things you want to do. And putting those things off has a cost. And in some ways that cost is way above money. So I want to hear a little about what made you actually take the step towards the book, because it, you said that it was on your list and it was something you always wanted to do, but maybe there was kind of that fear there but you had been writing this blog. So is some of that a transition from the blog? There are a few things. Um, I will say, interestingly enough, and this is, I think, the importance of really figuring out who we are and pursuing our sense of purpose. I've always said this before. I never felt comfortable in my skin as a doctor. And so, like, I never hung out in doctor's lounges. I have almost no doctor friends. The reason why I never built a community around being a doctor is because the identity I had built as a physician on the outside didn't really feel like my true identity on the insides. And so they didn't match. And so I never felt comfortable in my own skin. When I became financially independent and started thinking about all these things and started working with the dying, I had a renewed sense of figuring out who I really am. What is my identity and what is my purpose? What I learned was that my identity and purpose were much more surrounded by communicating, by public speaking, by doing things like podcasting. And I happen to like to do that in the personal finance realm. When I got in touch with that, I started going to meetings and hanging out with people who had the same interests. And for the first time in my life, I felt community. I had never felt community before. I never felt connected to people you know, us three have met in different venues in different places, and I feel an immediate connection to you guys, for instance, that I never felt to the doctors I knew in my life. Why am I talking about this? Well, my sense of community built because of my interest in being who I want to be and pursuing my own purpose. And one of the people who became part of my community is a guy named Grant Sabatier. He wrote the book Financial Freedom. People know him in this community. Him and I had been come fairly close. We had talked a lot about my writing. He had read my blog. We had met at a bunch of meetings. And one day he came to me and he said, you know, I love what you write about. You have this really unique perspective about money that none of the rest of us have. You need to write a book. And that was something I so deeply wanted to do inside and was so afraid that having a member of my community come up to me and say, you need to do this. It like dropped all my inhibitions. And not only that, he said, you need to do this. I've done this before and I'm going to help you. Like, I'll help you write a book proposal. I'll help you send it to some agents. I'll help you send it to my agent. Like all these things that had been like scary and unknown. Like, how do you get an agent? How do you get a publisher? Like all these things that I just didn't know how to do. This person who I cared about, who had become part of my community, was all of a sudden going to help me do that. And so it was part of the magic of undergoing this process myself is by becoming a better me, I surrounded myself with people who I was more connected to. And one of those people actually helped me tap into something that was deeply important to me and I was too afraid to do. Yeah, I loved this part of the book where you're talking about identifying yourself as a communicator. 
because I think I have been going through some of these certain um, identity crises of first, my goal was really around money because I needed to achieve financial independence and it was all consuming. And then later I was a little bit lost and I was thinking, well, it's got to be about helping people somehow or teaching or helping people figure out how to do what I did. But what I realized in reading your book is that I'm a connector. It's something I'm really good at. It's putting two pieces together. It's collecting people and then realizing where they fit in. And I love that. And so, yeah, some of the connecting I do is teaching people or putting them with the right people that are going to help them learn to invest. But it's not actually the money and it's not the concept of the real estate investing. It's the connecting of the community. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And by the way, the role of connector in any community, in my mind, is like so utterly important. Connectors are the people who bring communities together and often connectors are the ones who take two content creators and align them in such a way that something more amazing is formed. There are two connectors who I very much love in this community. One is Vincent Puglisi. Um, he has a total life freedom mastermind. He's written a bunch of books. He's, he's just just come out with a book. And then another actually group of connectors are Stephen and David Boyer, who do Phiology in the Camp Fies. Um, three people who I very much rely on in this community, and they're all connectors. I think it's an incredibly powerful role in any community. Mm, thank you for saying that. Ah, oh, these are the conversations I want to be having every week, Craig. I love yeah, you. we got a doctor. You coming on again next week? Sure. Yeah, we're just gonna, we're gonna just have you on for the rest. Of, yeah, you'll be the, our third co-host. People, people uh, get tired of you. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Doc, before we head into our, uh, our last part of the show, I want to ask, do you have, um, do you have family? Do you, are you a dad? You know, what, what's your, uh, give us that kind of background on you. Sure. So my wife and I got married in 2000, which makes me old, right? <laughs> We've been married over 20 years. We have a 17 year old son and a 14 year old daughter. I live in the Chicagoland area. My wife's parents live close to us as well as my parents and after my dad died, my mom remarried. So I have, you know, two brothers, a stepbrother and a stepsister and lots of nieces and nephews now. Okay. And are you teaching your kids uh, this, you know, now that they're coming of age, are, are they aware of the financial independence? Have they been saving? They got 401ks or whatever 17 year olds can have. They definitely, I've been very, very thoughtful, both on the podcast and kind of just in life about how kids learn, right? And so my theory is kids learn in two or three different ways, right? They learn the way I learned, which was modeling. I just saw all the great things my parents did and eventually did them in adulthood. They learn by didactic teaching, which I think actually is the least helpful. It's when you sit your kids down and say, this is compound interest. This is a savings account. This is a checking account. And last but not least, they learn experientially, meaning you give them a safe way to practice out in the world, a way that they won't lose too much. So, for instance, my son edits my podcast. So he listens <laughs> every week to two episodes of my podcast. And we do a lot of talking about this. But then we also try to give them some experiential knowledge. For instance, instead of giving them a weekly allowance, we give them a yearly allowance and then define what's their responsibility and what's our responsibility. And then they've got to allocate that money appropriately for the rest of the year, including some savings to figure out what oh. to do with it. So we've kind of worked the whole thing, but I'm not as stringent or put together as a lot of people. Like I could have my son. In fact, my son works for me. We've talked about Roth IRAs, but he doesn't have one yet. Like to me, that stuff's important, but much more important is the knowledge that he'll eventually take with him. Although a hundred percent true, you really compounding works best when it starts really early. So if you can teach a young person how to start investing and doing good things with their money when they're 20, they're going to be really psyched about it when they're 40. 100%. Time is the best, you know, time is the best return for sure. Yep. yep. Um, all right, Doc, before we head into the final four, any last parting words of wisdom before we head in? Well, you know, we haven't talked much about real estate yet, and it is a real estate show. Um, <laughs> I also became a real estate investor. We had four doors at once. I've recently sold them after many years when they've kind of fulfilled my need, which was to diversify my portfolio at the time. Um, I love real estate, but I also realized that if you're going to do real estate, you've got to really do it. I was always trying to do it on the side when I was doing lots of other things. 
And uh, I think you've got to put the time and energy to figuring it out, especially up front, if you want to do it right. Now you've piqued my interest a little bit. Did you, <laughs> did, did, you get, did you get burned at all in real estate or was it just a heavy lift for you? I got burned a little bit during COVID because I wasn't willing to put the time and the energy in. I owned a, a series of rental condos, it started by accident, uh, but eventually they cash flowed fairly nicely for me and, and owned for a good 10 years. During COVID, we had a rat infestation that was incredibly hard to get rid of in one of our units. We had cockroaches in a high-rise building that had nothing to do with our fault, but that didn't cause problems. In the midst of work from home, the city of Chicago came to our high-rise building and decided it needed external work. And so they were doing incredibly loud work, like March 2020, for the whole year when everyone had to go home and work from home. And so I was getting daily emails from my tenants about how they couldn't work from home because the noise was just horrendous from nine to five every day. And then we got one or two really difficult tenants who had great credit scores and had professional jobs, but really were calling us every day for things that were completely out of our control. So I think at that point I realized it's not a bad time to sell and I've gotten what I need to out of real estate. And so we decided to sell three of our four units. So I still have one. Sometimes I think it's the universe telling you that you're just not supposed <laughs> to do that anymore. And it's like, here's a bad thing. Here's a bad thing. I'm just going to keep giving you bad things until you're ready to let go of this. So um, I'm glad that you listened because I think it gets worse if you don't. Um, but I just want to be the first to say that real estate's not for everybody. And I don't want people to think that our show is only about real estate because it's also about financial independence and just that we've both used real estate as our vehicle there. But I don't think everybody has to do real estate to get to where they want to go. And I still think hands down, it's probably one of the best ways, especially as a young person, and especially if you don't have a lot to start with to get to financial independence. It really is just a great path. The final four. All right, Doc. Well, aside from your book, Taking Stock, what are you reading right now? So right now I read lots for my podcast and I happen to be reading a book called The XX Advantage, Unlocking Higher Returns and Lower Risk by Patience Maritime Bella and Dr. Ruth Schaber. And it's actually about how having more women involved in investing businesses, venture capital, and pretty much leadership positions is better for us individually and better for our economy. I've read about the first 100 pages and my mind has been blown a number of times about just the data out there about what happens when women are more involved in complex decision making, whether it's financial or not. Um, you know, one of the examples they use early in this book is talking about the response to COVID. And we see that there are a number of nations with female leaders who had just a faster, better response to COVID than the rest of the world. Um, you know, we everyone talks about New Zealand and Germany, and there's, there's just Iceland. There are a number of these places with female leadership. And they go on to tell the story also in business of how this is true. For instance, just a quick story. The crash test dummies that they use for car accidents that were developed in the 1970s were made for the average size and height male. And so there are a bunch of safety improvements that came of that. But what they found is that after they started using those safety improvements, they found that women were dying like two to three times more likely than men when they were in accidents mm -hmm. in the front seat. And they realized the reason why is because the people who had developed the crash test dummies hadn't even thought of making ones that were more appropriate and sized for women or children. For instance, women tend to sit closer to the steering wheel because they're not as tall. And so no one had taken these things even into consideration, but there were a few women who were involved in the research who realized this. And the improvements they then made to using crash test dummies that were more appropriate for women and children actually have created much more safety in the automobile industry. So just a fascinating book, even in the first hundred pages. Um, all right, Doc, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? You know, I think there are many of them, but ultimately when I put it all together, I think the best piece of advice is 
you know, you've got to learn it yourself. Like you can use experts and help and you can outsource to other people. But all the important things in life, whether that's investing or real estate or whatever is important to you, having experts doesn't mean that you let go of responsibility of getting in there and understanding some of the nuance on your own. I learned this, especially with investing. You know, I had an investment advisor for years. And as a busy doctor, I kind of said, oh, that's that's for him to do like. And so I never learned any of the details. I never understood what he was doing. And I almost feel ashamed at that now as I learned so much more about investing. I really needed to learn and understand myself if I wanted to make the right decisions. Love that. That's awesome. Question number three, what is your why? What is my why? So I think that goes back to what I think my true purpose is, which is I love to communicate with people. I love public speaking. I like podcasting. I love writing. I love storytelling. I, if I had to really condense it down is I love to tell stories that have meaning and connect to what other people are feeling in their life. Yeah, I really saw that today. I love your storytelling. Yeah, you're one of the best. All right, Doc. If you could be in any movie, what would it be? <laughs> Which maybe it should be like Die Hard or, you know, I don't know. If I could be in any movie, what would it be? That's a that's a good question. You know what? I love reading fantasy books so i would love to be in lord of the rings i think okay and what 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 them. character do you think or like what what it could be it could be a character you could replace a character or you could just like insert yourself in the book and add a whole another like dimension so i forget the name of the character the one who ends up being the king warrior type always knows what to do i just i love that idea of of, of being kind of the strong and the swift and and being the ethically and morally right as well as the physically capable so I, I i definitely i love fantasy books i will read you know i can get me like a, a fantasy writer who has a you know science fiction or fantasy that has like a 20 book series and i'm in heaven i'll just gonna read them maybe maybe that's your next uh your next book that you write then yeah maybe i don't know i don't know if i'd be good at it but but it certainly is exciting so. <laughs> all right Doc, where can people find out more about you about the book where can they get the book yeah give us give us all the info so the book is called Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. The easiest way is to find it at jordangrummet.com. That's my name, J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. I also have a uh, podcast called Earn and Invest. That's at earnandinvest.com. And you can find me in various places on social media, but I've done such a bad job of using different names for things. So the easiest way is to go to earnandinvest.com or jordangrummet.com and find all my social links there. Thanks so much, Doc, for coming on. Uh, you have such an enlightening and inspiring story, and I know that you've heard many other inspiring stories, and you're sharing that through your book. So thanks again so much, and um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me. And of course, you can get the book anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, wherever you want to get it. And that was Doc G. Z. What do you think of Doc? Uh, I really loved his story. He's a natural storyteller. And I just really kind of went along on the ride with him. It's just so great to hear his wisdom and his thoughtfulness and how he structures everything. So I just think I took a lot away from it. And even what I revealed in there about realizing through reading his book how I'm a connector and understanding a little bit more of my purpose um, has been just really profound and helpful for me. Yeah. And another thing he said too, is that, you know, I know a lot of people listening to this are, are involved in real estate, but you know, real estate may not be for everybody, right? Like we all are kind of agreeing to the fact that it's probably the quickest way to financial independence, but you know, it takes some work. It takes some, you're going to hit some bumps and bruises and, and we all know that. And we're all ready to take those. Out. But if you don't want to handle those, right? Like there's other ways. And so even with doc, he, he, he did real estate. Now he's kind of selling them off. He sold a lot of his real estate off. And now I, I suspect he's he's mostly in the stock market, just kind of, you know, doing the 4% rule kind of thing and, and living a very easy kind of coast-fi type life. So, Yep, there's yeah. no one way. We all can do it our own way. Yeah, and, you know, if there's one takeaway you get from this episode, I would say, like, think about what your true purpose is in life, right? Don't think about the money. Get rid of your money goals. Right. What would you do if you had enough money? What would you do? You know, what do you actually want to do? Do you want to coach a, your kid's soccer team? Like, do you want to travel? Do you want to spend time with your family? Like, what are the true things that you actually want to do? 
that can that, that you on your deathbed you will understand and, and you won't have to regret is I guess what I should say so think about that and let us know what your true life's purpose is by sending us a DM I'm at the Fi guy Z Ziana McIntyre let us know and if you haven't already, please, please, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It helps us out. It helps us get the show, broadcast the show out to the millions. And once you do, leave that review. Wow, that rhymed. Once you do leave the review, uh, send us a message on, uh, on Instagram and let us know so we can you know, give you a thumbs up and, and say thank you. Uh, so, Z, anything else before we head out of here for the week? That's it. We'll see you next week. All right. We'll see you all next week. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.